Hello, and welcome to another episode of Over My Dead Pod. This is your host for today's episode, Kate Carter, and I am joined here with my other hosts, Kylie Caldwell, Holly Spear, and we're going to jump right into it this week. All right, ladies. So this is a case that I've been following and kind of interested in since 2010. It's one of those cases that the more you find out, the more confused you get and the more questions you have. So let's go ahead and get started. This is the case of the Long Island serial killer, oh, also Lord. known as Lisk. Fun fact, this is my favorite. Is it really? This is all-time favorite. Okay, I have theories. Oh, let's go. Man. Okay, so now that will be interesting. I'm all, I will go ahead and say that the Long Island serial killer, also known as Lisk, is a very long and very complicated story. And I'm sure there's tons of parts that I probably didn't even get to. In this case, I'm going to kind of follow the story of one person in particular, and then we're just going to go from there. But at the end, I do have a few theories that I was going to get you guys to answer. So this will, this will be good. Okay. So the story begins in May of 2010. One night, a 24-year-old escort named Shannon was working in conjunction with her driver. His name is Michael. Shannon didn't have the best upbringing, but she was a super smart girl. She graduated early from high school. And she had really big dreams for herself. But, you know, after graduating, she tried the odd jobs like we all did, being a waitress, working the front desk of a hotel, et cetera. But eventually she hooked up with an escort company. It was too hard for her to get by with the minimum salary. And the big draw of these escort companies is that women like Shannon could make the same amount in one night that they would in four weeks with a regular job. So Shannon eventually has a few run-ins with the law while working for this agency and the agency eventually gets shut down. But that's when she realizes that she can start making more money if she just advertises directly online and leaving out the middleman of like an escort service. So the hope is that she's going to make enough money to get out of this lifestyle. So May 1st, 2010, it's around 1 a.m. in the morning and Shannon places a call to her driver, Michael saying that she's finishing up a job in Manhattan and needs to be picked up. So Michael goes and picks her up and Shannon gets another call from a man named Joe. Now Joe lives on Oak Beach in Long Island, which is about an hour 15 from where Shannon and her driver Michael were. But the pay was going to be really good. So Shannon had Michael drive her down to Joe's house. So it's around two in the morning now and Shannon and Michael arrive to Joe's. But since this job was so out of the way from the norm for Shannon, Michael decided he was going to wait in the car for Shannon while she goes inside and, you know, does her stuff. So along with her driver, Michael also kind of acts as a presence of security, which is nice. So from here, this is what we know. Shortly after Shannon arrives, her and Joe exit the house and they tell the driver, Michael, that they're going to go run an errand. Michael assumes it's a drug run and stays behind waiting in the car. So Shannon and Joe are only gone for about 15 minutes before they go back in the house. Now, we also know that about two hours after being at Joe's house, Joe comes out to Michael's car and says something along the lines of, dude, she's freaking out. You need to come and get her. Joe later tells a reporter that at the time, he wasn't sure if Shannon was a woman or why he wanted her to leave. He made a trip to the bathroom, and when Joe came out of the bathroom, Shannon was just acting crazy in the house. She was hiding behind a couch, stating that someone was trying to kill her. Joe also states that in the two hours of Shannon being in his house, they never had sex, and he never gave her money. Michael decides to go into the house to get Shannon, and when he does, he finds Shannon is acting super weird, and she's refusing to leave the house. So it was at this point, remember, still super early in the morning, Shannon called 911. And everything on the recording of the 911 call says that they are trying to kill me. And that call was made at exactly 4.54 a.m. At this point, Joe decides to check out. He's like, F this. He tells Michael that Shannon's his issue, and he goes upstairs to his bedroom, just leaving them downstairs. So Michael keeps trying to get Shannon out of the house, but she's acting insane. So he decides to go back to the car and wait for her. Because remember, he's just a driver. You know, he's known Shannon for a hot minute, but doesn't have any crazy personal relationship with her. But there was something that scared Shannon in Joe's house. 
We know that Shannon's call with 911 ended at 514 in the morning. And about this time, Shannon takes off from Joe's home. She doesn't get into Michael's SUV, but instead she bolts past and runs to a neighbor's house, banging on their front door at five in the morning. An older man opens the door. His name was Gus, and he was obviously startled. Now, Gus was awake at this time because he was shaving. And we know that old people love getting up at the crack of dawn to wake up and start their day. So he fortunately was there, opened his door. Gus's story has changed a few times over the years, but in this case, it's not really suspicious because it's more so just old age getting to him and not being able to remember details. So right before 522 AM, Gus tells Shannon that he's going to call the police to get help. This scares her and she takes off again. So around 522 AM, there's records that Gus did call the police. And now when Shannon takes off this time, she runs to the middle of the road but she sees Michael's SUV coming down the road towards her to come pick her up. So she decides to run and hide under a boat that is in Gus's driveway. Michael does a slow drive by and he pulls down his window to Gus and asks, have you seen this younger girl? We were all having a party and she got upset and left. So now I'm trying to find her. Well, Gus being the smart man that he was doesn't tell Michael anything and says that he has just called the cops. When Michael states, you shouldn't have done that, Shannon bolts out again from the boat in Gus's yard and takes off. Gus tries to follow her, but obviously wasn't able to catch up to her because he's much older. And he states that instead of taking a right and running out of the neighborhood, he watches Shannon take a left and go down a street, which just heads deeper into the neighborhood. But she knew which way she was going. She had pulled into the neighborhood that morning. We know that at one point, Shannon does stop at another house on this street, and that neighbor also called 911. So she's making rounds, banging on people's doors, and they're calling 911. So Michael's still looking for her at this point, but Gus is waiting at the gate for the police to show up. So when 6 a.m. comes around and it's starting to get lighter outside, Michael decides to leave. You know, he's been waiting for hours trying to find her and isn't able to, so... At 6.10, a good 40 minutes after Gus called the police, the police show up. The police don't do a full search at the neighborhood, and since they're only going off the fact that many people have called in regarding a strange girl running around, they just chalk it up to a crazy person and they leave. They don't do anything. So this is when things start to get a little strange. No one was ever dispatched to Oak Beach for Shannon's original call to 911. Remember, she's the first one that called 911 that day. But to make things worse, no one even put together that the first girl calling was also the same girl that other people had called in about. When police asked Shannon for her location while she was on the phone with them, she told them that she was at Jones Beach and not Oak Beach, which happened to be very close to each other as well. This is the last time that we hear or see Shannon. And that's where things get a little chilling because now it's two days later. Shannon was on Oak Beach on May 1st. So it's now May 3rd. And Shannon's family doesn't even know she's missing yet. She doesn't live at home with her family. So it's not really out of the ordinary for them not to go, you know, a few days without talking. But Shannon's mom, Mary, gets a phone call. And on the other end of the line is a man who introduces himself as Dr. Peter Hackett. First of all, I hate the name because if your name is Hackett and you're also a doctor, it just makes me think Hatchet and I'm just, you know. I thought you were going to say you didn't like the name Peter. I'm indifferent about the name Peter. So you'll, you'll see maybe why I don't like this person. So the guy on the phone introduces himself as Dr. Peter Hackett. Dr. Peter Hackett asks Mary, the mother, if her daughter is there or if she's still missing. Remember, she didn't even know she was missing. He says that he runs a house for wayward girls and that Shannon had been with him right before she went missing. He said that she had taken off the street when she knocked on his door and that he gave her a drug to calm her down. And then she left with her driver, but they never returned. Now, remember that house on Oak Beach where someone did call 911? Dr. Hackett lived next door to that house. So it's kind of weird and doesn't really make sense. 
The odd thing about this is that Shannon's mom didn't know she was missing. Mary is even more concerned because she doesn't understand how Dr. Hackett even got her phone number. When she asks him about this, Dr. Hackett says that anyone who comes into his house must give out an emergency contact. But Mary swears up and down that Shannon wouldn't have put her down as an emergency contact. Shannon would actually end up getting reported missing that day. Her family ended up trying to track down her lost movements, and they did find out that she was on Oak Beach, where Dr. Hackett called from. So when they make the police report, they kept getting bounced back and forth from Long Island, where Shannon went missing, and Jersey, where Shannon is from. You know, so there's a huge conflict between the two jurisdictions, which we know a lot about. So, so Dr. Hackett's story was that she would just happen to knock on his door when she was going door to door. Yes. And that he gave her a drug to calm her down. And then she left. And she filled out some paperwork yes. with her mom's number before she left. Okay, cool. Really? Makes sense. So being bounced and forth through jurisdictions and the reports end up staying in New Jersey, even though Shannon went missing in Long Island, New York. So because of this, that was one more reason that the 911 callers and police could never connect that Shannon was also the Oak Beach caller of 911, the first caller of the day. They wouldn't make this connection for another four months. Hmm. So this is where things get even more strange. The investigation into Shannon's disappearance is barely anything, whether it's because of the confusion of jurisdiction or the discrimination that people had against her profession, police just didn't take it seriously. We all know that it is a normal thing that when escorts, prostitutes, or anybody of that sort goes missing or comes up killed, stuff like that, it's usually not taken as seriously as it is if it was a child or someone of a certain color. That's unfortunate, but it's just the way that it is. Anyways, Mary, the mother of Shannon, and her family decide to go to Dr. Hackett's neighborhood on May 9th, and they put up missing flyers everywhere. And so this is the first time that Dr. Hackett ever met or talked to Mary, and he swears up and down that he never made a phone call to her, he never had Shannon over, and he says that he has no home for wayward girls, and that this is nonsense and Mary made it up. There's no way that Mary, the mother, made this up because if you remember, she didn't even know that her daughter Shannon was missing by the time she received the phone call. And she had no idea who Peter Hackett was. No idea. No idea. He's going to make up that name. And he just happened to live in that neighborhood. Yeah. Later on, obviously, it's found out that Dr. Hackett did, in fact, make this phone call to Mary. He used his wife's cell phone. And what is even weirder is that when he made the call, he was near mary's home in new jersey he wasn't in long island new york this has never really been sorted out because mary and dr hackett stick to their own stories and we don't get any more answers the only thing that we do find out is that dr hackett is a serial exaggerator we can see from his past that he has made up his own stories in his life that embarrassed co-workers or getting himself involved in things he shouldn't have been involved in So this was something that he was known for, which if everybody could take a second and think about people in their lives, we probably know at least one person who is like Dr. Peter Hackett, not naming any names, but you guys all know who I am thinking about. So it's just Dr. Peter Hackett was one of those guys that would stick his nose in whether or not he was involved and police ended up clearing him along with Shannon's driver, Michael. And the man that Shannon went to visit that night, Joe. So all of the main people right now have been cleared. Now we have to move on because though Shannon's part of the story is major, it's still just a small part of what's going on. So the summer goes on and then it goes into fall and no real search effort is put into place to find Shannon. Now there is one police officer that starts to bring in his police dog named Blue. I tried to find a picture and couldn't out in the fall to the island and he's seeing whether or not his dog can pick up any sense. But this officer freely admits that he really didn't believe he was going to find anything. And that since months had passed, the chances were slim. And he was really just doing this as a training exercise for his dog. So he goes out week by week and it's now December. All right. Everybody, she went missing in May and 
he focuses with his dog on the areas closest to Ocean Parkway. And so this area is called Gilgo Beach. That's a name you're going to want to remember, Gilgo Beach. Now, he knows that when a body is dumped, it's most likely going to be 30 feet from the road. So him and Blue search and search. And okay, so I need to set the scene a little bit for you here. So when you think of the word beach, you think of sand, ocean, a little bit of grass, but that's not really the case in this area. These beaches were marsh areas. So there was thick grass, thorns, and something that people don't walk through. Like it is a straight up marsh. So on December 10th, Blue, the dog, starts indicating that he's caught on to something. And sure enough, on the side of the four-lane parkway on Ocean Boulevard in Gilgo Beach, the officer follows his dog into the marsh, and that's where he finds a burlap sack holding decomposing skeleton remains. Everyone assumed at this point that the remains were of Shannon, who had been missing for several months, but it wasn't her. It's discovered that the remains were of another young escort named Melissa, and she went missing in July of 2009, a year before Shannon. A couple days later, police find three more sets of remains in the same spot. All skeletons, all wrapped in burlap sacks, and all young women who happen to be escorts. Now, these women that were found were named Megan, Maureen, and Amber. And all three of them listed their services on Craigslist or a back page, just like Shannon and Melissa. So right now we have four dead bodies and one missing. But none of these women were Shannon. And so police put together these women and named them the Gilgo Beach Four. They officially announced on January 25th, 2011, that they're looking for a serial killer. And while they keep trying to comb the land a little bit longer, they eventually hit a wall when the weather starts to get bad. Now, remember, this is in New York, Long Island, and they're on the coast. So December, January, February are basically impossible to get out there and search weather-wise. They have to stop for the winter. And so while they're on pause, the police start investigating these women. The best place that they can start is with the people who were players when Shannon went missing back in 2010. And at this point, they're thinking everything has to be related. They go back to Joe, who Shannon was with the night of her disappearance, and they vetted him out and couldn't link him to any of the other girls. So then they go back to Michael, Shannon's driver. But again, nothing on him. He's cleared. So then they go to Dr. Hackett. And again, he is cleared, which is crazy. Do they ever say anything about like why they cleared these people? And they're just like, oh, they're good. They're Gucci. They're Gucci. That's we don't good. under we don't know anything about how Dr. Hackett got weeded out. His story to me just sucks. So I don't understand how he's vetted at all. Mm-hmm. But you'll you'll find out some more information later in the story. So with the locals wrote out, the next step is that police are taking a deeper dive into the girls' lives. So who did they all know in common? Who were their clients? Was there anything that like stuck out between all of them? And they ended up not being able to link the girls to one guy, though all the women used Craigslist for their clients. The website actually used encrypted emails. So that hides real email addresses and whoever was the person on Craigslist doing these services actually was able to hide their IP address as well. So we know that at the moment, there's no way to backtrack a hidden IP address because this is early 2010s. So police weren't able to track anything. And whoever was doing this had to have some type of computer knowledge. It should also be noted that the police believed all the girls knew this one person somehow and that they would be comfortable with letting their guards down around this person. Because a couple of the girls left to go meet a person without a purse or a cell phone, which is a really big no-no for these type of workers. And there's one particular story that really did stick out, and that's the night that Amber, one of our bodies, was last seen. So the last night that Amber was seen, she had gotten an offer to do a call for 1500 which is a lot higher than the usual rate. An offer that was too good to not take, and it seems like a common theme with all of these missing or dead girls, that they received an offer that was just too good to not take. So the John, because we don't know his name, so I'm going to call him John. So the John was going to pick up Amber, 
And when he arrived around 9 45 PM, her roommate walked her down to the edge of the driveway and said, bye. What this roommate now states is that what really haunts him is if he had only walked a few more feet, he would have been able to see in the car that the John was driving to pick Amber up. So knowing that this John had the ability to make this girl comfortable and she didn't bring a purse, she didn't bring a phone, you know, you kind of think, okay, so this person had to be semi-normal. They had to feel comfortable with the females. They had to have known them. There's nothing really else for police to go off on, except they have one really big clue. Remember the first victim that was found, Melissa? Mm -hmm. The killer had been using her cell phone to call Melissa's little sister. So he would call her multiple times, and this was going on even before the murder investigation. And this was while Melissa was still missing. Her family had not been able to get a hold of her. And after she had been missing for a long time, Melissa's younger sister gets this phone call and the caller ID pops up from Melissa. So immediately she picks up the phone, but of course on the other end, it isn't her sister. It's a guy and he says all these vulgar things to the young girl asking like if she's a whore like her sister and a bunch of other information that he shouldn't have known unless he knew Melissa. But this caller keeps his calls short. They're always 90 seconds or less, usually under a minute. And they're always between 5.30 and 6.30 p.m., which makes me think post-work call, you know, like if that's a, a normal time. And every time that this person calls Melissa's younger sister, he's calling from a heavily populated area so that if police try to track down the phone, They'd get location pings like Times Square or Madison Square Garden. And that's impossible to track down one person on a phone in Times Square. You know, like it's, it was a very smart thinking on, on behalf of the, the person calling. So these calls fit the same pattern, except for the last one. The last time that this person called Melissa's little sister, he said, I finally killed your sister and I'm watching her body rot. That's when police traced the last call. And they find that the call was made from the phone in Gilgo Beach, where the body was later found. But the press get wind of these calls and they publish the information, which makes the calls completely stop and police lose their only connection to what they thought they had with the killer. This happens quite often, too. So once this happens, the case stalls until the spring, because remember, we were still in the winter at this point. Now, police are able to get back into the marsh and search once the weather clears up. And on March 29th of 2011, police find a skull, hands, and forearm. And these remains were found on Ocean Parkway near the initial Gilgo Beach four bodies. But they were a little bit further away, about three-fourths of a mile from the others. The remains appeared to fit the same profile, but the strange thing is that these remains were not wrapped in a burlap sack like the rest of them had been. These remains were also not placed in a row like the others. But most importantly, this body had been dismembered and all of the other remains that were found were full human bodies. So to get stranger, when police discovered these remains, they also discovered that these remains belonged to a torso That was found in 2003 and it was found in a city called Manorville, which is not really close. It's in the same state, but not close. So we find out that this girl's name is Jessica and Jessica had been an escort who used Craigslist. So the police continue to search on the beach. And a few days later on April 4th, they come across three more body parts, another skull, hands and foot. And this also belonged to another victim that torso was found in Manorville. So now we have like two sets of different bodies and deaths. You know, the ones that are the Gilgo Beach four that are lined up in a row, full bodies, burlap sack. And then now a little bit like a mile away, we have dismembered bodies whose torsos were found in a different town years ago. And they just never were able to connect the two. So it's kind of of weird. We're going to keep going. So to this day, the second pair of hands and skull and stuff have not been identified. The torso was never identified. And so that one remains as the Manorville Jane Doe. So again, this person matched the profile of all the other victims. She was an escort, used Craigslist or back pages for her services. 
Now, police continue to search and near the same area, a little bit further down on a place called Oak Beach, they find two more bodies, but these are totally different from any of the others found. They find the body of a young Asian male. He's intact and dressed in female clothing, but police have not been able to identify him to this day. This is a personal thought, but most likely I assume he was a cross-dresser. And in the fact that it's early 2000s, there's a chance his family and his friends just didn't know that he was a cross-dresser. You know, so for him to be identified would be very hard. They also found next to the young Asian male, the body of an unidentified baby girl. Now she was between the age of 16 months and 32 months for people who can't do math between one and three years old. So at the moment, there's eight victims. So let me paint you guys a picture of where all these bodies have been found because I've been saying a few different places. So picture in your head, we're in the ocean, okay? On a boat in the ocean. And we're facing Long Island. It's just a big, long strip of island. On the far left side is Jones Beach. In the middle is Gilgo. On the right is Oak Beach, but it's all one long strip. In the middle is where the four intact bodies were found in Gilgo Beach. On the right side, Oak Beach, you have the unidentified Asian male and the baby girl. So the police keep their search going. And on April 11th, they find two more sets of remains in two separate areas. This time it's far left on Jones Beach. Okay. So one of the remains is the bones and jewelry of a woman who ends up being linked by DNA to the baby girl. And the second skull that was found had matched to a set of legs that washed up in Long Beach in 1996. So we're going way back. In time, you know, 1996 is the first date so far. Otherwise, the torso in Manorville was from 2003. So the more that police find, the further the investigation goes back, which is kind of crappy because it's just a lot happening all at the same time. So all in all, we now have 10 victims and Shannon is still missing. When all of these bodies were being discovered, there was a huge fight between the prosecutor's office and the police department because they were running on two different theories. And so this is where I'm going to have you guys come in a little bit too, because I want to hear what you think as well. So the Suffolk County Police Department commissioner, his name is Richard. He said this is one serial killer and that Shannon might not be involved in the serial killer of the other bodies. But the prosecutors think that it's two killers and wouldn't say what they thought happened to Shannon. So it makes it a little bit more confusing because while they're investigating everything, everybody has two different opinions. Now, let me explain this. So there was an amateur profilist named Peter, another Peter, and he said there are two distinct signatures. So first you have the Gilgo Beach Four. The profile thinks these victims were killed by a trophy killer, meaning, you know, like the way somebody hunts and then they, you know, put all their deer heads on display. It's kind of the exact same thing. This killer lined up the bodies in an orderly fashion so that when he drives by or goes by the area, he can see all of the mounds lined up. Now, it's a specific type of killer for the second one. So they say you've got the Gilgo Beach four bodies that were all lined up. But then you also have the torso killer and this kind of killer enjoys dismembering because the first set of girls weren't dismembered. The second were, and the torso killer enjoyed porting the torsos on display. So like the torsos were found in Manorville and then the rest of the body parts later on years later were found on the beach. What's odd is that these two killers chose the same type of victims and they discarded them in the same place. So that's where people come in, whether or not there is one killer or two different killers. But it really depends on how you look at it. The victims are similar in the fact that they were all sex workers, but the Gilgo Beach four bodies were kind of distinct because they were all small, very petite girls in their 20s. That was, a you know, that that's how they were all connected. But granted, we don't know these victims in life. You know, some are still Jane Doe's and even a John Doe. 
But people who are in favor of the one killer theory say that there's no way multiple killers would drop the bodies in the same area. And that alone should just prove it's one person. But people are also justified that the killer got more sophisticated over the years and got more comfortable. And so he went from maybe lining up bodies to then dismembering them or vice versa. Some of the bones of the victims who weren't a part of the Gilgo Beach Four were linked to body parts that were obviously, like we said, 1996 and 2000. So all we know is that the Gilgo Beach Four girls that went missing were between 2007 and 2010. Are people thinking that it could be like a copycat killer or, or just like someone taking advantage of there being bodies and no one finding who did it? So that's where some, it really comes into play on what you think. If you think there was one killer, he obviously went from dismembering bodies to then just keeping them intact and lining them up in the same place because he was like, nobody has found my, my dismembered bodies. They're not going to find these big ones, you know? But if there were two killers, the fact they dumped them in the same place is real. And because there was no media, they didn't know that the other mm. bodies were there, you know? So it would be in my head a little weird for it to be multiple people. Yeah. Now I'm kind of thinking it probably is one person that realized that their dumping grounds just got found out. So they're going to go a mile down the road and dump there. I've, I've heard a theory about if it is two which I'm leaning towards one, but if it is two, that they're kind of playing a game. They have two different victim types and they're just trying to, you know, outplay each other. Like they know about each other. So we're about to get into that for a second. So like I said, if you do believe the two person theory, you have the trophy killer who kept all of his victims intact. And then you have the torso killer who dismembered all of his bodies. Okay. So the Gilgo Beach Four, though, were the lightest victims because they were not found until 2007 and 2010 when the girls went missing. The others were from the 1990s. It could have been that the killer used to dismember all his victims and spread their body parts in different locations to prevent identification. That makes sense. And he would keep little evidence away from himself. But as the years went on and the killer was never caught and the bodies were never found, Maybe he became more lackadaisical where he thought he didn't need to be cautious with the bodies. So there's another idea that needs attention. The fact that some people think are two distinct killers. So the possibility comes with the one trophy killer who killed the four victims in Gilgo Beach and the torso killer became jealous over the media attention of this case. And so he decided to put the body parts from the torsos in the same area during the winter. Cause remember the crime scene stopped for like six months because of the winter conditions. So it could have been super easy for the other killer to be like, okay, you found these bodies from a few years ago, but you haven't found mine in the same area from 10, 20 years ago. So police in the spring found all of the bodies and dismembered bodies and all in marsh areas. The investigation goes on through the summer and fall and winter, and Shannon's family is still pushing for police to find her because if you remember, she's still not one of the bodies found. Police finally get permission to drain a large marsh area, and guess whose house lines up to this marsh area? Dr. Peter Hackett. So on December 13th, many of the victims' families come together to hold a vigil for the girls' one-year anniversary of the bodies being found. And while the families are there, people are searching for Shannon's remains in that marsh area. Shannon's mom, Mary, was there, and they actually took her onto Dr. Peter Hackett's back porch so that she could have a better view of the marsh area where the investigation was happening. Shannon's Mm -hmm. body was found on Oak Beach and closest to the identified child, but she was furthest away from all of the other victims. Her face, she was found face up and her body was not wrapped in a burlap sack. She was also not dismembered. A quarter mile from where Shannon is found, they found her belongings, which included jeans that appeared she took off the jeans. They weren't ripped. And before an autopsy was done, the police commissioner was already saying that Shannon's death was an accident. It had gotten out to media that Shannon had bipolar disorder. She was obviously an escort 
And the theory from law enforcement was that her mental illness combined with drug use at that time caused her to have an episode that night and she ran into the marsh. So even by the time they did do an autopsy, they weren't able to determine the cause of death. But the theory was that Shannon had a psychotic episode, got confused, ran into the marsh. Now, they say the marsh can get super cold at night and that she could have suffered from hypothermia, which is why she was shedding her clothes, because that is what happens. But I don't really believe the theory of hypothermia in May when she went missing, because that's getting a little farther away from the cold temperatures of New York and, and everything in May. Long Island or not, but they say she suffered from hypothermia, fell into the marsh and drowned in about six to eight inches of water, even though she was found face up. The only thing that her body was missing was a hyroid bone. Now, for those that don't know, a hyroid bone is very small and it could have been carried away by animals. But usually when you have a case of a missing hyroid, it also could mean strangulation which is why Shannon's family didn't agree with the police's cause of death. So we're now in 2012 and police determine and finalize that Shannon's death was accidental. They tested Shannon's external remains for drugs and didn't find any. They used these findings to say that Shannon wasn't on drugs that night, but they didn't actually test her bones, which leads a lot of people to say, why would you give a definite yes or no to the drug theory if you don't do the proper like steps? to figure it out. It was concluded by most people that Shannon's death didn't have anything else to do with the murder victims that were found, though she was the missing person that started this case. Shannon's family is still not okay with this answer that their daughter's death was accidental. So they have an additional autopsies done. Now this autopsy was done in New York city and by a very high up coroner. And They state that there was insufficient evidence to determine any type of cause of death, but he does note that the autopsy findings were consistent with strangulation. Shannon's family believes that Dr. Peter Hackett was potentially the reason for that strangulation. Now, Shannon fit the Gilgo Beach four victims to a T. She was young, in her 20s, petite, but the big difference was that Shannon had a driver. The other girls were always picked up. So when we go back to Shannon's 911 call. There's a reason, which is a good reason for why people can't let this case go. Even though Shannon's death had been ruled an accident and her remains were found, police refuse to this day to release the audio of Shannon's 911 call that started everything. Even her family hasn't heard it. There is one theory that people have for the police to keep this recording is because Shannon originally, remember, she stated she was in a different location. So She got bounced around from a lot of different people in jurisdictions, and it really became an error on the police's end. They never reported to that phone call. They didn't connect her for months for the investigation. Now it's 2015, and the FBI finally joins this investigation. But the FBI was kept at arm's length because the DA and the police, during this whole entire time, had corruption within their police department. And so they didn't want the FBI to figure that all out. Now, if you remember, the chief of Suffolk County police commissioner, who I talked about earlier, he had a huge problem with drinking and driving on the job. He had a history of drugs and a history of prostitutes. And remember, all of our victims are escorts. And because he had a history with the exact type of girls he was investigating, it it didn't look good. Now, a lot of people believe that the killer had to have been in law enforcement or someone who knew law enforcement policies because of how he knew to make the calls to the victim's family and never get caught or how he knew how to hide his IP email address, you know, stuff like that. So along with Dr. Peter Hackett and Joe, the man that Shannon went to visit that night, the names of suspects that come up the most in this whole entire case are two people we haven't talked about. Their names are James Pissett and John Bitrove. John Bitrove. His story is kind of crazy because he was a family man who had no history whatsoever in the criminal system, but his brother was arrested for violating a protection order. Now, when his brother was arrested and they took his brother's DNA, it matched 
for the rape and murder of two women who were strangled and posed. But the brother wasn't a full match. It was only a partial, meaning someone specifically related to him was the rapist. Well, they tested it again. They were able to find out that it was identical to Don Bitro's DNA. And he just happened to live a few miles from where the torsos were discovered. And even stranger, his daughter had grown up to be one of the best friends of Melissa, one of the Gilgo Beach Four victims. So if you remember, Melissa was the one whose sister was called by the killer so many times. And also remember that whoever was calling Melissa's sister happened to know a lot of details about her and the family. But police never called John Bedroth a suspect. Now, let's go over to the other suspect, James Passett. James owned a nursery on Long Island, which gave him access to the identical same type of burlap sack that the Gilgo Beach four victims were all found in. And speculation really grew around James Passett when he committed suicide a few days after Shannon's remains were found. But again, police never named James Passett as a suspect. The only other name that ever got thrown around, a man named Neil Falls. Now, Neil had a ton of media around him in 2015. And at this time, it was in West Virginia. So not in New York, not in Jersey. And he went to the home of a sex worker in West Virginia named Heather. While he was there, Neil pulled a gun on Heather. They fought. Heather ended up shooting Neil in the head. When police arrived, they found four sets of handcuffs on Neil, and then in his case was a machete, axes, knives, a shovel, a sledgehammer, bleach, plastic trash bags, bulletproof vests, and clean white socks and underwear. Your casual overnight bag. There's my red flags, ladies and gentlemen. If you ever need a serial killer 101 bag, that would be it. That would be it. So. Today, Neil is still being investigated as a person of interest in the murder of escorts and prostitutes in eight different states. So he's obviously related to a very big case outside of the Gilgo Beach Four. Everyone says that Neil could have potentially been the Long Island serial killer, but the truth is, is he's probably not. The Long Island serial killer, Lisk, he never went to the girls' homes. The girls always came to him. And police gave input that Neil is most likely not their guy for the rest of these murders, but still very interesting story in the future. Now, the truth is truly that too many depraved men take advantage of these type of women because it's easy and they assume that the law enforcement doesn't care. So what now? This just happens to be one of the biggest American serial killers mysteries ever. There is one case, though, that is just too easy not to list as a case of the Long Island serial killer. And you guys will know this one because it's the case of the Eastbound Strangler. In 2006, four women later identified as escorts were found in a drainage ditch behind a hotel in Atlanta City, Jersey. Now, the hotel was one of those sketchy, like one story hotels, like on the side of the highway, which you should never go to people. Okay. That is just a crime central. Never go to the hotels that are one story on the side of the highway. Now, all of these girls found in the drainage ditch were placed face down, 60 feet apart in a row with all of their heads facing towards Atlantic City. All of the victims were closed, but had their socks and shoes missing. And the cause of death was ruled strangulation for all of them. The bodies in Atlantic City were found in 2006. And then the Gilgo Beach first victim was found in 2007 in the exact same manner. If it was the same killer, he stopped in Atlantic City, killed these four, went to Gilgo Beach, killed four. So where else did he move on and kill four more people? You know, there's a huge pattern that this could be two different serial killers. So, okay, I want to go into it a little bit. From what I've said, Kylie and Holly, do you think that there was one killer or two killers? I'm leaning towards one now. I'm also thinking one. And I think Shannon is just unrelated, just very weirdly connected, whether it's an accident or Peter Hackett. I'm just stuck on the fact that Peter Hackett just, I just think there's something else to it. He, 
he just he made was, up all this stuff and got away with it. Yeah, like what's what are the odds that all the arrows point to you and then your neighbor is, you know, having a girl come to his house and then she just like falls into your lap? I don't know. It's just weird to me, you know? Yeah. I just no, feel like I, there's something else we're missing. Yeah, I feel like if it is one killer, he, you know, changed MO. They do like evolve, even though he kind of like de escalated from like dismembering to just dumping their bodies off. You guys both think it's one killer, right? Yeah. Okay. So after doing all this research for the podcast today, I think it's two killers. Mm-hmm. And I think that there was the trophy killer and the bodies were all lined up. And then there was a torso killer. And I'm curious about the fact of the victims coming in fours. So the further I got into the story, the more on board that I'm getting with the Atlantic City murders done in the exact same type. And then one year later, still near New Jersey, you know, right over on Long Island in New York for women, the exact same type of women, exact same profile were also killed and lined up. And I'm thinking that those two are probably related and that there was a second killer the torso killer who was first in the 1990s. And I feel like it might not be related, but I am stuck on the location because I think it would be very highly unlikely that two serial killers place bodies of their victims in the same area within a mile. You know, I think that that would be really difficult, but even the end of the story where the killer moved on and went to different spots, it would make sense with Atlantic City, Gilgo Beach, Though they had the same M.O., they were never connected. You know, this is just other people putting it together. So that was a lot of stories. And there was Shannon's missing story, the Lisk story, which could have been two separate murderers, the Neil Falls story where he got shot, and then the eastbound strangler that was the Atlantic City. These could all be related. They could all potentially not be. But in the end, today is December 31st, 2022. And not a single person to date has been charged or convicted of all of the deaths. And with that, I conclude the Long Island serial killer murders. Mm-hmm.